How you doing everybody? So today, we will be dissecting the Karate Kid Part 2. So let's get going. After recapping some of the key moments from the first film, we pick up right after the tournament. People are gonna be talking about that last kick for years. Man, you got no idea. Being the sore loser that he is, Kreese takes out his frustration on his students by assaulting them in the parking lot. And nobody does a damn thing about it until Miyagi decides to save the day. You know, Kreese might be scaring the hell out of his students, but I'd say he's doing a pretty good job at keeping the local autoglass company in business. After letting Kreese off the hook, we then fast forward six months later and look, Miyagi finally caught a fly with his chopsticks, leading me to wonder how sanitary his living conditions really are, since flies seem to be constantly in his living space for him to attempt this on a repeated basis. Daniel returns home from senior prom with a banged up car that apparently Allie from the first movie is responsible for, and she's now fallen in love with the UCLA football player, so bye bye Allie. On top of that, he breaks the news that he'll be leaving for two months to go to Fresno with his mother. It's around these moments, I notice that whenever Daniel starts whining or talking too much, Miyagi gives him something to do. Here kid, hammer this nail. But with Daniel in a mood and his life going out of focus, Miyagi needs to find a way to get Daniel to relax so he can do all the housework for him. So in the nicest way possible, he tells him to get his shit together and breathe. Yeah, you hit a nail. Gold star for you. So it now turns out that Miyagi spoke to Daniel's mother last night and Daniel no longer needs to go to Fresno so he can stay with him. It's at this point the mailman shows up with a registered letter from Okinawa. Now this mail carrier is just weird. I don't know if this guy is the director or someone who won a contest to have a walk-on cameo role, but while delivering the letter, he talks about how he loves the yard and his wife loves this kind of stuff, then asks if he can bring her over sometime to see. Uh, my missus loves this stuff. You mind if I bring her by sometime to see it? Jeez, you casing the place, buddy? Just move along. So the letter from Okinawa is some serious business. Miyagi's dad is really sick. <laughs> Jesus. Anyone else curious how old he is? So now, needing to return home to see his father, he's able to get a passport because he has a next day plane ticket? I've actually never heard of that before. Was or is that a thing? We then find out the reason why Miyagi left Okinawa in the first place. It turns out he fell in love with a girl named Yuki, but she was arranged to marry his best friend Sato. And instead of selecting bros before hoes, Miyagi was willing to still marry Yuki and break tradition. Sato then felt disgraced and challenged Miyagi in a fight to the death in order to save his honor. Instead of fighting his best friend, Miyagi then ditched Yuki by fleeing Okinawa. He stresses to Daniel the seriousness of honor in Okinawa, hinting that he's probably walking into a total shitstorm the moment the plane lands in Oki Town. As Daniel's leaving that night, he tells Miyagi that he'll stop by in the morning to say goodbye to him before he leaves to the airport. But Daniel has that look in his eye. Like he's about to do something stupid. And the next day, instead of showing up at the home to say goodbye, he shows up at the airport instead. But he isn't there to see him off. Oh no. Miyagi isn't getting away from Daniel that easily. Instead, without asking his permission first, Daniel decided to buy a plane ticket to Okinawa so he can tag along with him. And then asks if it's okay after the fact. Talk about an uncomfortable situation. Miyagi is going home to deal with some serious life problems, and Daniel puts him on the spot like that? With him is also a book on Okinawa history, and he's claiming he wants to study it. Yeah, nice touch, Daniel. After a long and sleep-deprived flight due to Daniel constantly talking, they finally arrive in Okinawa. There, they're greeted by this character, Chosen, who has a car waiting for them. Things seem normal at first, but after realizing they're going in the wrong direction, the cat comes out of the bag and they pull into a small hangar, where Sato emerges looking cool in a business suit and sunglasses and in a raspy deep voice, calls Miyagi a coward, and still plans on fighting him to the death. Miyagi refuses, but since Sato holds a grudge longer than a 16-year-old girl against her parents, he doesn't care and still plans to kill him after he sees dear old dad. You see your father, then you see me. After finally showing up at the village, they're greeted by Yuki's niece, Kamiko. Reunions can be awkward, but damn, reuniting with your past love in front of a dying parent? That's some next level shit. Yuki says she's known where Miyagi was for many years, but she never wrote sooner, out of respect. We now learn that she never married Sato either. 
The next day, we get a look at the Miyagi Family Dojo, where we learn the secrets of the family's karate. Rule number one, karate is for defense only. And Miyagi says rule number two is first learn rule number one, but I think he's covering something up here. Here, Daniel, take this toy to keep you occupied. After a tour of the village, Sato decides to show up and says it's on for tonight. Still refusing, Sato feels he now has no choice but to now kill Miyagi in front of the whole village. And at that moment, Yuki gets between them. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess that's nothing new. She tells both of them that Miyagi's father wants to see them both. On his deathbed, he tries to make them friends again. But instead, Sato decides that, out of respect, he'll now give Miyagi a three-day mourning period before killing him instead. Wow, what a guy. And right over his body. Dude, it hasn't even been five minutes since he passed. Can you at least wait until you're both outside? After the funeral, Daniel consoles Mr. Miyagi, and for the first time in a long time, he actually says something kind of heartfelt and meaningful. I'm not kidding. Maybe he does have some brain activity after all. And due to the next scene, I take that comment back. You alright? Yeah, I'm sorry, that was pretty stupid. Then, doing his best to fit in, and always great at making new friends, Daniel unintentionally exposes Chosen scamming villagers. While keeping himself entertained in the middle of the street, Kamiko approaches Daniel and shows him some dance moves. Chosen then shows up. You dance very nice. Like Geisha. Wow, that was a real sick burn, man. And then, like most people throughout this trilogy, decides to rough up Daniel a bit, threatening to kill him if he insults his honor again. We then stumble upon Miyagi and Yuki having a tea ceremony. Kamiko explains that it means that they're falling in love again. This is a big deal. It's like first base in Okinawa. If that's the case, don't eavesdrop, man. Let them have some privacy. After some sightseeing with Kamiko, Daniel asks her what she wants to do with her life. Kamiko brings him to an electronics store window. So what do you want to sell TVs for a living? She then points out the video of the girl dancing on the television. Oh, you want to be a dancer? Just a little slow there, buddy. Well, that's a great thing to be. And yeah, that is a great thing to be. Of course, depending on what kind of dancer. I'm sure there's some very disappointed fathers out there. A random person who just happens to be played by actor B.D. Wong, who you'll know later from roles in shows like Law and Order and movies like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Anyway, he pops up to invite Kimiko and Daniel to the dance tonight. Okay. Good. See you there. They then stumble across a bar, where people are breaking blocks of ice for money. Chosen shows up to take bets, and after protesting that he either breaks some ice or gets a broken neck, Daniel agrees to participate. Miyagi and Yuki show up to save the day, but instead of breaking it all up, he asks what the betting odds are, and they're 3 to 1 that Daniel won't break all 6 blocks. Miyagi bets $600 in favor of Daniel. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What happened to rule number one, karate for defense only? Well, I guess rule number two really then says, unless it's for a financial gain. Daniel has his moment of glory and breaks the six blocks. So later on, the three-day mourning period is over, and Chosen shows up to get Miyagi. He explains that he still won't fight him, though. Chosen and his little thugs decide to destroy some crops. Later that night, it's the enchantment under the sea dance. Oh wait, sorry, wrong movie. Alright, so they're at the dance, and Daniel busts out some moves that are at least a little better than this twirling business from part 3. They then sit down, where he asks Kumiko if she's arranged to be married to anyone. She laughs, and says it's an old custom. Yeah, Daniel, didn't you read about this in your book? Chosen then shows up to break up this lovey-dovey moment because he wants his money back. Jesus, this guy is like a walking visa card, because he just shows up everywhere you want to be. After grabbing the money off Daniel, Chosen gets a nut punch that sends him to the ground, which allows Daniel and Kumiko to get away. You know, I'm really amazed how quickly Chosen recovers from that, though. I don't care who you are. A direct hit to the crotch that close is going to keep you on the ground for quite a while, unless, of course, there's just nothing there. Later that night, Sato shows up at the Miyagi compound, looking to fight, but he's nowhere to be found. Daniel tries to interfere, but instead is restrained to watch Chosen vandalize the dojo. And finally, just as Chosen is about to crack Daniel's windpipe, Miyagi shows up to kick some ass. 
Interesting little fact, not only was Pat Morita not wanted originally for the role of Mr. Miyagi, but he didn't even know karate at all. With Daniel in the familiar position of being hunched over on the ground again, Miyagi's had enough and tells them they're leaving tomorrow. When breaking this news to Yuki, she's obviously heartbroken, again. Well, at least he's telling her this time. She asks him if she can go with him, and Miyagi should bring her. After all, earlier in the movie, he says he regretted not taking her with him in the first place. They even had a tea ceremony to show they're falling back in love. But I guess that was all just pillow talk, because when she requests to go with him, he just kind of looks at her and the scene ends. A very annoyed Sato and a bunch of his workers show up to start plowing over the farm and leave Miyagi with an ultimatum. Either fight Sato at midnight or the village is destroyed. No matter who wins though, the land will be given to the village and they'll no longer need to pay rent to Sato. Seeing this as a win-win situation, Miyagi now agrees to fight. Kumiko prepares a... Wait, is this... Is this a tea ceremony? It is! Daniel might finally get lucky. Oh, is the seat taken? This isn't the time for jokes, Daniel. I'm sorry. But unfortunately, Mother Nature has other plans as a giant storm abruptly rolls in. Everyone starts running for cover, and the hut Sato is in blows over. Were these homes made out of toothpicks? I mean, they've obviously had storms before. And nobody mentioned one of this caliber was on the way? We just went from zero to a hundred in the blink of an eye. By all accounts, Sada was going to fight Miyagi at midnight, while Daniel was going to sip some good tea and possibly get lucky, so where the hell did this storm come from? Chosen runs for shelter, claiming Sada was dead, but he isn't. He just did a piss poor job at making sure. Miyagi and Daniel free him and bring him to the shelter. Daniel then plays hero by climbing a pole to save a girl. Instead of helping Daniel at Sada's request, Chosen wusses out. Sada can't believe it. Also, where is this girl's parents? And why don't they go out there instead? Yeah, scream in Daniel's ear a little louder. I'm sure he loves it. Chosen now looks like a total coward. And he should. Anytime Daniel LaRusso succeeds in looking cooler than you, it's a good time to run and hide. Which Chosen does after Sato says that he's dead to him. With the village now wrecked and a big change of heart, Sato decides to help come rebuild and let his grudge with Miyagi go. They then have their festival. Everyone's having a good time. Kamika's dance is interrupted when Chosen crashes the party. The guy certainly knows how to make an entrance, I'll give him that. With his honor stripped away, he now wants to fight Daniel to the death in an attempt to get back. But I don't know how that's even possible, because even if he beats Daniel, he's still holding an innocent woman at knife point in front of the entire village during their festival. So I guess that means nothing? Miyagi reminds Daniel that this isn't a tournament, it's for real, and he doesn't even try to stop him. You know, I would love to know how Miyagi would explain this to Daniel's mother if he got killed. The two then duke it out, and in what looks like it's about to be a definite victory for Chosen, Daniel is able to turn things around and breaks out the Miyagi family drum technique to win the fight, and then shows mercy. And I guess Yuki and Kimiko were never really that important to either of them, because we never see them again. The end. Well everybody, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you haven't checked out the video for part 3 yet, I suggest you do. And if you haven't yet, I would really appreciate your support. Please subscribe, and I will see you soon. Thanks.